Um, and Ethna, are you can you are you there? We'll make sure she can hear us. Oh, we're live now. We're live now. Okay. Excellent. Well, um, I'm State Senator Jamie Eldridge, and thank you so much uh, for those for joining another edition of Uplifting Voices, where I have a chance to speak to uh, community leaders uh, from communities of color um, and leaders of color uh, to talk about their experiences and how do we combat systemic racism and white supremacy and really honored uh, to have as my guest today, a teacher um, in the Acton School System, um, is Mi Byun, um, who's an English teacher at uh, the high school at Acton Boxborough Regional High School. So Mi, thank, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And uh, we were just chatting about the fact that um, you had uh, been recommended to, to my office to have this discussion by one of your students, uh, Sophie, who I believe uh, is one of the writers for the high school student newspaper that was covering one of the uh, Stop Asian Hate rallies that I was at in Acton. So that's, that's how we got connected. And, and she and another student asked some great questions. And they did a great story on that rally and, um, you know, the lens of discrimination, uh, inclu including the rising discrimination against Asian Americans, including in Massachusetts. So that's how we got connected. And you've been a, a teacher at, at the school in Acton for, for how long? For two years, this would be my second year at Acton. Okay, okay. So that's been, I'm sure it's been an interesting year for the past year te teaching uh, high school students. Uh, yeah, to say the least, it has been a very unexpected uh, roller coaster, um, but very fruitful. I think that I wouldn't trade this experience in a strange way. That's great. That's great. And, and um, you're, you participate in the, in the eCares, uh, is it the organization or, or entity at the, at the high school? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so the eCares group is a um, teacher group at the high school that um, we look at how we can incorporate um, social justice and equity into the school. There's multiple subdivisions. Uh, of the of the group, I focus on the professional development side for this year. Okay, okay. And I know last summer, uh, really after the uh, murder of George Floyd by Officer Derek Chauvin, and um, I'd say a, a, just an increase increasing organizing around racial injustice. You know, I met with a group of graduates of Acton Box Bro of, of color um, called Absedge. And so I met with them and, you know, some of the conversations we had about, you know, how do we um, move towards more, um, there being more teachers of color in the Acton Box Bro regional school system. Um, discussion, of course, in the beginning around the Colonials mascot uh, conversations around uh, Acton and Boxborough law enforcement. So, you know, that that was sort of one of my first touch points for conversations happening in the school district, aside from, from some conversations with the Acton Boxborough school committee and school superintendent. But in terms of your, your work around professional development, could, could you talk a, a bit about what that work is and what, are you seeing any changes? So, uh, I think the group it itself is very young in terms of we just started this summer and we were thinking about their act in Boxborough for several years now have pushed uh, DEI work and more training around equity and understanding equity. But we realized as we have these opportunities that people are at just very different states and stages of development. Um, and so the idea of having a uh, in-service, uh, in-school group that is consistently looking on how to support teachers 
uh, we wanted to create different avenues for people to enter in the different spaces that there are in. Um, and so that was really the intent. I would say this year it has been a part of the ongoing work and there's at least the recognition that this work is going to be continuous no matter what and being okay with that um, understanding. And so that, that that's where we're at now. Okay, so a bit of a bit of a work work in progress, you'd say. Mm -hmm. And and in terms of forgive me for not knowing, but but how how diverse um, are are the professional staff or teachers at Active Oxborough Regional High School? Uh, so out of around 180 teachers, there are four teachers of color, including me. Uh, Jeez. Yes. Okay. Wow. Okay. So a lot of, a lot of work to be done. Yes. And I am the only in, um, teacher of color that doesn't teach a language. Uh, okay. Okay. And if I may ask, were you recruited to the high school? How, how did you end up at, at Acton Box Pro? So a friend of mine that um, I was in a graduate school with together, uh, he got hired at Acton first. And as we were going through our job search, he recommended and tried to say like, you should really consider applying to this school. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it was really a matter of chance. I've looked at other schools and I applied and you know I was getting interviewed, but um, some schools just came to me, districts came to me much later. I applied in March and they would return to me in August. Uh, so by that point, Acton was very quick in getting me into the door, uh, having mm -hmm. me go through my interviews and um, telling me that they wanted me on their team. And so I, I said yes. And also it was really the student population. Uh, I have mm -hmm. actually not worked with Asian Americans specifically until Acton. Mm -hmm. and, and where did you teach before? I uh, worked at a very small private Catholic school in Brighton. Okay. Okay. And what was the diversity of the student body there? Just curious. Uh, it was, I can't tell from the top of my head, I would say like 30% uh, Black and Latin X, a few Asians, but they were all international students um, mm. and then white. So, but the diversity was quite high. Okay, absolutely. And in the Acton Boxborough Regional uh, school district population, you know, obviously now there is a, a very high uh, population of Asian Americans, right? Yes, it's, I think, 34% Asian Americans now. Okay, okay. Has that, have you, have you noticed uh, uh, an ability for some of the Asian American students to, to better connect with you because of, of you being also Asian American? Uh, I would say um, <laughs> my students have always connected with me in all the different places, but if mm -hmm. you were to see the Christmas or I mean holiday cards I receive or the thank you letters I get, there's just a level of like vulnerability and depth and um, a lot of them say, I am so grateful to see you as an Asian American teacher, it makes me uh, understand that I can be like you, like a teacher. Uh, in my two years, I've had four students of color tell me that they want to pursue education. Um, oh, that's terrific. That was that's great. It, it's a wonderful feeling. But yes, my Asian students do, um, I guess, flock or connect to me in a way uh, mm -hmm. that I had not had with other students before. Okay, okay. That's, that's terrific. And that, that must feel absolutely wonderful to, to get that, those expressions. Yes, it's, it, it's, it was quite shocking. I didn't know that it would happen, but I was grateful for it. That's great. And did, did that happen at the school you taught at before? Or? Uh, it did happen. Um, I've also done my student teaching at Brighton High School. I've worked in a lot of mm -hmm. urban uh, communities and it was still really great. I enjoyed working with every student at all of the settings. Um, I think that the fact that I could speak very directly to the experiences of being a person of color in the world and even mm -hmm. more specifically a Asian and what that means in a, in a world that tries to think in very white and black 
uh, racial mm -hmm. terms, um, mm -hmm. and then the ability to give language to what they were feeling and the dissonance they were feeling, I think was particularly um, meaningful for my students. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and in terms of the professional work that you're doing is, is part of eCares, what other aspects of that do you think that will lead to a more diverse um, professional teaching staff at, at Acton Boxborough? That's the hope. Uh, when you think about a school in, in trying to increase its racial diversity amongst the staff, some people think that, oh, once the teachers are in the door, then we can make a space for teachers of color to thrive, but it's actually the opposite. You need to create a space where the environment, where it's already ready for teachers of color to be able to thrive, survive, and feel welcomed. And so mm -hmm. I think the work that we're doing in eCares is setting that table for them to come. And it, it could, could you give some examples of that, of how, how, how to make it more welcoming? Uh, yes, so we already started in the district a BIPOC affinity group. So uh, once a month, all of the teachers of color in the entire district come to meet and we can talk very openly about uh, the things that we're dealing with and then make recommendations to um, uh, Marie uh, Altieri, who is sure. the assistant superintendent. Um, there's also ways that in that space I've advocated for um, coaching or mentorship for teachers of color that is provided from outside the district so that we don't use the already exhausted teachers of color within the district. <laughs> uh, and so there's other conversations that I'm having with my department head on how can we create onboarding processes for teachers of color in terms of this is how you can find mentorship, support. Um, and my hope is that just like our students, that we see them as the whole people and all the identities that they hold. And so when I see my students, instead of saying, oh, I don't see color, I see, no, I see that you're Asian. I see that mm -hmm. you're black. I see that you're mm -hmm. Latinx and I see that you're white. And I know what that might say and shape your experiences. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to help you feel really present and known in this moment. And so I want that kind of to translate over to when we think of our staff, um, how can we also say that to the people that enter into our doors and extend that same level of, I see you and I know what struggles you're going to deal with and we're gonna prepare in advance for those struggles. Mm -hmm. That And that is that is very encouraging. Is this, do you see this as like a three or four or five year plan to really have an impact or how do you, how do you feel the timeline is? <sighs> Um, I can't say because I'm not on those teams. Um, there mm -hmm. is a separate policy team that works uh, directly on hiring and uh, they, I think they're going to have a presentation on um, the realistic amount of teachers of color that they can have within the next few years because uh, how do we measure how many people are leaving and how many people will apply. And mm -hmm. so even before um, interviews, the hardest part is actually marketing uh, your school in a way to have teachers of color even want to come. Mm -hmm. and, and I will say, sometimes the comments I hear um, from, you know, educational leaders or um, in some cases, quite honestly, you know, white teachers is, well, you know, the, the, the challenge is, is there's not enough um, you know, uh, people of color going through to become teachers, you know, there's not enough of a, a supply. Is that, is that inaccurate or what, what is your, your take on that? Uh, it is true that um, teachers of color, there's not a lot, like Asians make up 2% of the teaching population. Uh, mm -hmm. But when we think about it on a historical level, what that is, we know that it, a lot of that is a byproduct of things like Brown versus Board, which was great in ending segregation, but there was a mass firing of Black teachers and administrators, which um, destroys that pipeline of, mm -hmm. of professional acceptance. Um, and, but I would say that there are still many teachers 
Um, they're not living maybe in the state, but if we were to recruit potentially from California, and a lot mm -hmm. of uh, schools have started doing that. They've started looking mm -hmm. out of state and finding places where actually there is an abundance of teachers of color. Um, even California on the opposite end, they care a lot about um, teachers of color recruitment. So they will extend uh, recruitment outside of the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's a really intentional way to try to um, bring more uh, diversity into uh, the staff, um, but mm -hmm. with very intentional marketing. And is 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 Acton Box for doing that? That kind of outreach or marketing? Not to my knowledge. I think the current systems that they have are still the traditional routes that you would go for hiring. Um, I only know this because I've also participated in the principal search committee. So mm -hmm. getting the insight into that. And is the traditional route going to teaching colleges in, in Massachusetts or? Uh, no, in, in terms of like school spring or uh, in terms of um, recruiting firms that they use, they might not be, they are looking outside of the state, but not particularly maybe recruiting specifically for people of color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So it, it sounds like there's more week, work to be done. Is there is there interaction with with eCares and in the school committee, or is this just with the sort of professional staff in the school district? Um, in terms of hiring, uh, yeah, and recruiting, yeah, or, or just policies, yeah. And policies, I think a lot of uh, people are having a hand at it. And so they're trying to come up with ways um, to work towards that goal. Uh, it is a priority at the school district, but the way we come to that, it, um, uh, how, how is it actually implemented? A lot of people have varying ideas. Let's just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just say, and, and I think this is, you know, my perspective as a you know, legislator is that you know, when, when the Education Reform Act passed in 1993, a big part of it that I think doesn't get a lot of focus is that a lot of the power of school committee members was, was taken away uh, with a, a sense that somehow, you know, school committees, um, perhaps with a particular focus on the unfortunate Boston School Committee, but that, you know, decisions weren't being based on, on policy or, or for the benefit of, of students. And therefore, it went to the, um, you know, the superintendents, the principals, the, the professional staff. And I think the challenge, you know, I would just say is that, you know, you have people running for school committee um, increasingly, you know, focused on, you know, racial justice and, and diversifying, um, you know, teachers and, and professional staff. And yet, you know, sometimes I do wonder, and this isn't just about Acton Boxboro, but I just do wonder, you know, what what do school committee members, um, what, what is their influence versus, you know, what the school superintendent or the principals do. So, mm -hmm. so that's just a general, you know, I'm not asking for <laughs> a comment on that. It's just, it's just something that I think sometimes people don't realize is that school committees um, don't have as much, you know, um, power, if you will, is, is I think some people do. Um, no doubt, you know, who gets elected is, absolutely critical but um but there there is a dynamic of you know the school superintendent or principals having <clears throat> a great amount of influence as well so um i i know besides eCares um in your your bio you also advise a, a student-led asian american activist group at, at the at the high school is that right yes i uh, the activist group is called dear asia youth or day uh, it mm -hmm. is actually a national organization with subgroups in different, uh, I think they're actually global, there's uh, mm -hmm. many people, but I had two students come to me in December telling me that they wanted to create this group and they would like me to be their advisor and we've taken off ever since. That's great. It, how, how many, how, how many, do you know how many um, students are part of the group now approximately or? We're averaging over 20 at this point. Okay. And, and was this, um, 
This was before uh, some of the focus on um, attacks on Asian Americans in general, or was this as a result of it or? It was a result of it. The students were seeing and reading in the news the increase of um, hate crimes and discrimination uh, once Corona mm -hmm. uh, had uh, come to the United States. And this was mm -hmm. their way of, you know, they were feeling lost. Like the news were not mm -hmm. portraying or not, uh, you know, properly reporting these cases to the degree that they felt was necessary. And, um, and the fear, the fear of this increased hate uh, and instead mm -hmm. of, you know, being stuck in that fear, they had the courage to say, we're going to rally our voices and create this activist group. Mm -hmm. That That is great to hear. And and were there, were some of the students talking about that, that they were uh, the, the um, that, that, that slurs or discrimination was being directed against them by, by non-Asian students or, or residents in, in the communities? Uh, so, yes, in the sense that th it has always been there. Uh, I think there's a misunderstanding sometimes like, oh, this is only happening because of coronavirus. But the reality mm -hmm. is it's just being highlighted uh, by it. So all my students, we had this one particular moment, a meeting where um, they sent out a survey and one of the survey results um, was racist, like a student had um, submitted a, a racist response to it. And at mm -hmm. first they couldn't come to, they tried to say like, maybe they were trying to say this, like explain it away. But the moment I affirmed that like, no, this, this was racism, just tons of stories started pouring mm -hmm. in about their childhood, their lives, uh, mm -hmm. everything that they were experienced in Acton. Um, and towards their families and the racism that they've experienced. And, and then also um, de definitely the experience of last year, like hearing in the halls, like, um, oh, mm -hmm. you know, with, this was in our, the model minority presentations that my students gave, but mm -hmm. uh, one of the lines was, um, that they heard, and this was from uh, an anonymous report, was that another student had said something along the lines of, I hate the FN Chinese, I wish they would go back, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and also there's like this sense of um, that the rigor of the school is because of the students, the Asian population. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. I find that quite curious because, and my students noted this too, it's the teachers that set the level and standard, not mm, necessarily mm -hmm. the children. Right. Yes. Absolutely. And I and I've certainly, you know, I've I've heard, um, you know, un unfortunately, some, you know, often white parents, you know, talk about that or, you know, geez, you know, the the school is so competitive because there is such a large percentage of Asian American students, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so it's something that's I think said you know, unfortunately, fairly, fairly frequently. So um, you, you mentioned the, the model minority, and, and I, I will say that's, I think, an increasing um, discussion now. And I, and I would say part of it is, you know, what is, are, are there growing connections between Asian Americans, you know, facing, facing discrimination and um, racial justice that, you know, especially uh, last year uh, since the murder of George Floyd, there's been a big focus on, you know, um, uh, racism directed against uh, black Americans. And, um, you know, sometimes there has been collaboration uh, amongst a wide variety of, of people of color, you know, Latino, black, uh, Asian, indigenous, but but sometimes there is either not collaboration or, or tensions. Is, is that something that you, you have any observations about what's happening in the school district around that? Uh, in terms big of- Big question, but- <laughs> Yeah, it's a big question. So Asian Americans sit in this very unique spot of um, being the model minority, but also the perpetual foreigner. So then we are mm -hmm. put up to a standard, oh, uh, Asians are better than Black Latinx people, but then we are separated from the Black community and Latinx community in that way. Um, 
and we're also separated we're never reaching whiteness because we're the perpetual foreigner and so you exist in this gray zone where um you feel that you don't exist because uh, uh everyone is ignoring or avoiding and what that causes in terms of tension is then for Asian Americans, if they have internalized a lot of that racism, is to actually perpetuate anti-Blackness um, mm-hmm. in, in the ways that they, they work, uh, but then also strive for whiteness, but then never achieve uh, the success that they, they believed through the, the myth of meritocracy. Mm-hmm. In Acton, and specifically, there is a sm- very small Um, Black population at the high school in comparison Mm -hmm. to the Asian American students. And so my goal for my students is to, uh, one, address their Mm anti-Blackness, and two, see the same goals and policies that are helping everyone, not just them specifically. How do we also work in a way that is affirming and uplifting every uh, member of our community, especially Black and Latinx members. Mm-hmm. That is not a, a separate thing and that our freedoms are actually tied together. Mm-hmm. And so that, that's fantastic. That that's so important. Yeah. And and do you do you see uh because I assume are are there um uh black student organizations in, in the high school or Latino student organizations? Yes, the Black Student Union also um, is present. The Latinx uh, student group is just forming. And so now once we have um, more established leadership, the goal is to have our advisors meet regularly and also have Mm -hmm. the student activist groups meet on a regular basis to see where we can do uh, the work that intersects between all of their their identities. That that's really great to hear. That that is terrific. And 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 speaking of identity, so so you grew up in in Philadelphia, right? Yes. Yep. And uh, I know your bio says uh, you were molded by the small uh, K town uh, in 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 Philadelphia. So so that's uh, Korean Korea town, or is that correct? Yes. And it's odd to call it a Korean town because most people wouldn't <laughs> because it's so tiny, but it ob- it very obviously is. Yeah. Yeah. And and so what, uh, if I may ask, how, how did your experiences uh, growing up Korean American and in a K-town, uh, how did that mold you or influence you? So... Uh, just to be clear, I actually don't usually talk like this. I'm code switching because I was born um, and raised in an area that was predominantly African American as well. Hmm. And so, wow. uh, and other um, mostly heavily immigrant populations, I also moved a ton, but I say that I was formed by this K Town because we always seem to return back to this space. And mm-hmm. so, um, I my parents are uh, working class. Korean Americans. My dad works in construction and my mom uh, owns a dry cleaners. And so what we saw was uh, the necessity to live in an area that was lower cost of living that we could afford and then intersecting Mm -hmm. then with the African American community there. And so I was raised with uh, anti-Black views because we were conflicting with that space. Mm -hmm. My, in in the sense that uh, like, there were um, moments where we, mm, my dad was mugged outside of our own house, right? Mm-hmm. By someone who uh, appeared African American. My, uh, we often saw um, arrests very regularly growing up, mm-hmm. and the people being arrested were often African African American. Mm-hmm. And so I grew up in with this weird space of. Um, having to deal with that uh, anti-Blackness, but also my dad all, and my parents really being um, connected to that community because that's the space they lived in. Now mm-hmm. they live in a space where it's still predominantly African-American, but a little um, more middle class. And so it changes their expectations and their understanding also of um, what it means to be Black. 
And so I think that's helpful. Um, but in terms of also growing up, that means that as an Asian American, I was, um, I had this dissonance because uh, it's the turmoil of being Asian uh, and having a lot of responsibilities of being a second generation immigrant, we become language brokers for our family very quickly in mm -hmm. terms of um, translating documents, going to these different meetings um, at a very young age, reading like rent, the cost of rent, tax forms, <laughs> legal documents, mm -hmm. and translating for my parents. Um, and I think that's actually in essence why my parents continue to stay in that community is because we need that community. Um, mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. are translators in that area, in that K-Town that provide services for my family in a way in capacity that I cannot. And so mm -hmm. I, I see the value of that community and how it serves and supports each other uh, for specifically the Koreans there. So I, I know that was a long wash, but anything specific? No, <laughs> no, that was, that was a uh, very, interesting in, in um, I will say, so I, I went to uh, college in, in Baltimore um, at a college where it was a large um, Asian American community, including significant um, percentage of second generation Korean Americans. Um, and, you know, some of what you say, uh, you know, re resonates in, in their, in their experiences. Um, including around, uh, you know, anti-blackness and then coming to, you know, uh, the city of Baltimore, which is, you know, majority African-American and a higher percentage of, um, of black students at the college and, and, and really trying, you know, really sort of facing for the first time, you know, those anti-blackness, um, you know, uh, views, you know, um, and, and sort of coming, coming to terms with that. And, you know, I, I will say that, and this isn't with students, but I would say more um, Asian American parents in Acton and Boxborough is certainly since, uh, you know, racial justice protests, you know, began uh, since last May, um, you know, absolutely a lot of conversations, um, including, you know, sort of the different experiences that you know, many Black Americans have had uh, versus, you know, Asian immigrants is that, you know, they're, they're obviously struggles uh, within different, you know, ethnic groups and nationalities, but that the, the sort of anti-Blackness uh, strain that's global, um, you know, has a, a particular impact on the Black community that's different, perhaps, from how, you know, Asian Americans are Latino Americans are discriminated against. So, so that's, that's a mouthful as well, but it, it, it has, it has been interesting just to, to have those conversations. Um, and, you know, one of the experiences I talk about uh, from a few years ago is that uh, the town of Acton uh, was deciding whether to become a sanctuary town and, um, with in response to to then uh, President Donald Trump's you know focus on on deporting uh, many undocumented immigrants that are disproportionately from uh, South American countries, who are Latino and you know one of the the first hearings um, you know there were there was a, a, a disproportionately high number of um, you know Asian American residents who, who basically were speaking out against. The sanctuary policy, um, because there was this, you know, there was not a connection with the Latino community in Acton and Boxborough, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's something that, you know, since then, and, and I would say it was uh, in Acton in Boxborough, as as I'm sure you observe, it's it's predominantly uh, Chinese American and Indian American, but you know, having those conversations. Uh, with those communities about, you know, immigration policies in general, and and actually making progress such that Acton, you know, did become a a sanctuary town, you know, with the support of <clears throat> pretty much all the residents, which was really great to see. That's really great to see. Yeah, yeah, it was it was very encouraging, um, and 
I would say just to just thinking about the the Chinese American community, and this has been you know a hot a hot button issue, is the uh, discussion both around affirmative action in colleges and related to it a bill around uh, data disaggregation. Are you familiar with that legislation? Not the second. Okay. Well, basically, it's um it's legislation that that sort of would would allow uh, Americans of, of all backgrounds to, to not just identify as, you know, Asian or Pacific Islander or, you know, Latino or, or Black or Indigenous or, or white. But within that, um, if they, you know, um, have roots in a particular country, so, you know, China, Korea, Chile, um, Haiti, and there, there were a number of um, Chinese American residents uh, across the state that that organized against it uh, because I think they saw it as a way as a possibility to um, uh, limit uh, their ability to get into colleges especially you know elite colleges like Harvard so mm -hmm. so it, it comes into this discussion that I'm, I'm sure you're aware of around um, you know, uh, different positions within the Asian American community around affirmative action, basically affirmative action, usually for, 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 for BIPOC, for Black, Latino, and Indigenous students, so. Yeah, so with the um, affirmative action, I was at Harvard when that case was mm -hmm. brought, um, and I met yeah. with, the, we were talking with the lawyer that was um, defending affirmative action uh, mm -hmm. an hour before her court meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so this is pretty, but yeah, in that uh, particular case, there was actually no Asian plaintiff. Uh, it mm -hmm. was a white group trying to end affirmative action, actually using Asians as a way to um, show that it was racist, but that was mm -hmm. using the Asian community and understanding that a lot of this stems from the belief of um, that things are zero sum. That if mm -hmm. I take a little bit, then uh, it will take away from someone else. And sh shifting away from that mentality is incredibly hard because some people might argue, oh, if I take this job in, job in Acton, I'm taking away a spot from a white teacher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, but if we view things in that way, then we're perpetually in conflict with each other. For mm -hmm. the Chinese American community, um, you know, my husband is Chinese American. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I have some insights into that <laughs> community a little bit. Uh, it's understanding that trauma, I understand why they fear that from coming from mm -hmm. what sure. they've experienced in their history. Um, but understanding that um, if we say that we all belong. Um, and if you are bringing down other Asians, that is inherently going to hurt you in the long run. Uh, we saw this when Japanese internment was happening in mm -hmm. which I also just called American internment because they were just Americans. Uh, mm -hmm. The Korean community was for that right here in the States because mm -hmm. you no know, Korean occupa uh, Japanese occupation of Korea. Sure, so sure. There's a lot of these ways that there's, um, because Asian is just a very large umbrella term that doesn't even encompass or talk about all of the specific issues. In terms mm -hmm. of the data uh, separation, I think that's a great idea in terms of um, the Asian access and or mm -hmm. success economically is bimodal. And mm -hmm. so we have a large population of individuals who um, might not have immigrated voluntarily. And so their experience is very different from someone who has uh, had come for a degree and had the need access to do, that, do so. Uh, I also still think that um, there's, there's a lot of misinformation am amongst the Asian community on that front as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, you really hit the nail on the head. And, and you know, I will say, and, and I think there's a greater appreciation now is from, from the broader Asian American community is, is that obviously 
if there was that ability to to identify, you know, uh, large pockets of, um, you know, uh, Asian Americans of particular ethnicity or nationality, so you know, Chinese, Korean, you know, Cambodian, is that you know then you know the hospitals in that area, the schools, other services can you know provide appropriate language services. Um, one of the things that uh, has come up in, in Acton, uh, particularly within the Chinese community, is a, a, a certain number of uh, Chinese American women uh, that have lung cancer, and whether you know that is something that is genetic specifically to the Chinese community. And so, you know, if we had that data, there would be the ability to you know break those things down just to to find out you know are there specific differences in you know, how does the government respond to and, and support all communities? So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting bill. It's definitely a bill that, you know, there's still a fair amount of opposition to. And, and part of that is it's, uh, in, in my opinion, part of it is that it, 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 it would um, in some ways, you know, attack the model minority stereotype because it would highlight you know that there are differences within the Asian American community. So, so that's a, a dynamic. Um, in in terms of um, your growing up uh, second generation, j just curious. I mean, were you someone that that experienced discrimination, whether growing up in in Pennsylvania or your time here in Massachusetts, or if I could ask, what what have your experiences been? Um, I have the obvious answer is as a person of color, I've always experienced discrimination. Yes, it's not yep, nothing yep. new. It's like <laughs> the air you breathe. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the flavors of racism are different where you are. <laughs> uh, is the the best way I can determine it because I've um, I grew up in Philly. I lived a year in Missouri, a couple months in Tennessee back to New Jersey, to Philadelphia. I've moved six times in my childhood across states. Um, mm -hmm. And, but when I came to uh, Boston College for undergraduate, uh, I was very shocked at the particular flavor of racism that Boston had to offer. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and uh, as a Massachusetts native, I, I think it's just, still shocking to me how much denial there 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 is from from white residents uh despite you know many stories many examples um and and you know leaders of color whether in massachusetts or across the country you know validating that when when they are or when they visit massachusetts yep mm -hmm. do you do you have hope that 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 we're at a moment where that is changing. I mean, I, I will say I've never seen more, um, you know, government entities, nonprofits, you know, businesses, communities, you know, focus on, you know, combating systemic racism. You know, that being said, you know, that absolutely doesn't mean it will be successful. But how, how, how do you feel as a teacher and as a, as a resident in Massachusetts? Mm. I think I've read too much history to see how this goes. <laughs> yep, uh, yep. I have to maintain a, a realistic hope. And mm -hmm. um, there's a group, uh, a small group of friends in Brookline. They are retired professors um, and uh, they're in their 70s. And it's, mm -hmm. it's three, three individuals in their 70s, uh, one identifies as African American to our Jewish and then me and another friend. And we meet very regularly to talk about how we can um, grow and uh, basically create an anti-racist just world. And they've been doing this work forever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. And right. so Many do decades, I, right? yep. yeah. So do I expect discrimination to end? Uh, unfortunately, no, but can we get closer and closer, even a little bit? Um, that's the the hope that I give my students that they have agency mm -hmm. in this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you saying that, and and I will say, and that was part of why I was asking about 
you know, what's happening in the schools. And I'm, I'm also asking, you know, the uh, now that's called the select board um, or, or city councils in the communities I represent is, you know, many of them have formed the, the DEIC committees to, you know, look at diversity and inclusion. But, you know, I would say that the jury is still out. I haven't really seen any actual policy changes or, you know, things that have made these communities, you know, more welcoming. So mm -hmm. um, with the possible exception, I think po police, some police departments have taken some, some action, but, but certainly it doesn't, you know, for the most part, it doesn't go far enough. So with that, I think the biggest thing that is hindering people in making changes is this um, feeling that it needs to be perfect, that they can't just be okay with progress. And mm -hmm. I always tell my students, there's absolutely no such thing as perfect. There will never be such a thing as perfect. So all we can do is make some progress. And I hope that that is encouraging that you will fail. It's okay, um, mm -hmm. but you can still try again. <laughs> <laughs> and and in terms of progress what what progress would be meaningful to you whether whether talking about massachusetts or, or the school district like what 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 things would you like to see that really would be meaningful or or, or give you hope or show that you know there is the possibility for for change uh, in the state of Massachusetts, and a lot of people have been talking about it, but really thinking intentionally and carefully about um, the way that we do discipline in schools, right? Um, I mm -hmm. worked in schools where, uh, like, I could definitely see the the pipeline, the school to prison pipeline, mm -hmm. um, and the fear I have of that of treating our our students, our children as something dangerous. I think that it reverberates not just for the Asian community, uh, the black community, but that can affect the Asian community uh, in a lot of ways. And so there's that. I also would love to see um, work on, you know, having uplifting people of color into leadership positions that are not just for a figurehead, right? Like being very intentional mm -hmm. and careful of allowing um, people of color to uh, have spaces, but also be supported to make those changes. So because my fear is if I were to go into a, a position of um, a little bit more power, uh, would mm -hmm. people then just idolize that and say, oh, the work is done. We have this person mm -hmm. and therefore we don't <laughs> need to contribute, which has happened. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and uh, to give the, the most uh, perhaps famous example of, you know, Barack Obama becoming president and, you know, wonderful rate racism is over and we can end that sort of chapter in our history. So, and it, it came back with a vengeance. So, yes. Yep. Um, but, um, but no, I, I so appreciate your, your work and, and also your, your hope uh, and, and being hopeful about, you know, what's going on in the school system and in hopefully Massachusetts. And um, I, uh, we, it's, all, these conversations always uh, just go so smoothly as it's, it's been about an hour and, and I just want to thank you uh, me so much for your for your time uh, to speak to me in uplifting voices and um, I don't know if you you have any final thoughts or, or things that that I didn't ask you'd like to to raise but I, I really appreciate our our conversation today the only thing I have left is that um, for any of my students that might see this video uh, I'm thinking about you and I'm thankful for you for teaching me all the stuff all the all the wonderful things that you always teach me so that's wonderful. Thank, thank you so much, uh, me beyond. Thank you so much for coming on to another edition of Uplifting Voices. And uh, it was a pleasure uh, to have you as a as a guest. Uh, well recommended by some of your students. And um, welcome. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. And uh, have a, have a good night. And thank you, me. Thank you.